All right. Okay. All right. You ready to do this? I'm ready as I ever can be, as I okay, say. Get a drink here. <laughs> right. I'll do the same, actually. All right. Mm-hmm. All right. Okay. So five, four, three, two, and one. All right, guys. Mm-hmm. Welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. Guy McPherson here. Uh, continuing on with our series on COVID-19. Uh, when I asked my community who I needed uh, to include in this series and who people needed to mm-hmm. speak to, Fran, your water, your water, Fran, <laughs> your, na- <laughs> your name came up. I like up. water. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so welcome. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really pleased that it came up. Thank you. All right. So Fran Waters is an internationally recognized trainer and consultant in the field of childhood trauma, abuse, and dissociation. As an invited presenter, she's conducted extensive training programs nationally and internationally, ranging from a a day to five days in Europe, Africa, Australia, South America, and North America. Fran is the author of the book, Healing the Fractured Child, Diagnosing and Treating Youth with, with Dissociation. And she's also past president of the International Society for the Study of Association. Fran's a fellow of the ISSTD and received ISSTD's Presidential Award and Cornelia Wilbert Award, the Media Award from American Professional Society on Abuse of Children for her three-part DVD on trauma and dissociation of children. Wow. Uh, Fran, mm-hmm. welcome again. Thanks so much for, uh, mm-hmm. for being here and taking part in the series. I'm really delighted to be a part of this. Yes. All it's right. Very- I'm going to start I'm going to start off okay. and just um ask you what I've been asking everyone else. What <laughs> is going on? <laughs> As a million dollar question and a million dollar answer, <laughs> but it's a combination of a lot of um, a lot of uh, influx from many different parts of our world on many different levels of a virus that is um, affecting worldwide all of us. And we're all affected in various ways, some more unfortunate ways than others. Um, and uh, I think one of the things that, that I think that maybe is quite, quite important is this pandemic is really showing that we are all one together. Mm-hmm. We are all connected. We are one community in the world. Um, the idea of nationalism really seems small and trite and really a misperception of what's happening. Uh, this is a shared experience. Uh, it's a unique experience, and there's a commonality among all of us now, unfortunately, by this experience that's causing us to reevaluate many, many things in our life, personally and in our world. Yeah. And it's a shared experience, both positively and negatively, in the sense that people, some people are getting sick, some people are unfortunately dying. So, you know, I, I brought you on to, to, to hear about your perspective on uh, both that, that global perspective, if you will, and the more individual perspective as a shared experience where does trauma play into that? How does how is it showing up? For example, well, I, the trauma is showing up with people with increased anxiety, increased fears, uh, depression. Uh, the people that are most vulnerable are those who already have those, you know, past traumatic events where they have a sense of helplessness a sense of hopelessness, a lack of control. So I think this is compounding for those people uh, that fear, particularly if they have a loved one in the front line of serving the, mm-hmm. the, the people that are struck with the virus, uh, fear of losing their loved ones, losing the anchor person in their life that keeps them going and presents challenges for us therapists to be present for them at the same time in a 
a setting where we have physical distance and we have to then use web uh, sessions in order to be there for them and help them. You know, I was speaking with someone who brought up the uh, idea that people who uh, have mental health challenges, uh, even before, you know, pre-COVID, mm. uh, well, maybe people now, people who are, are starting to have a little more compassion, you know, and understanding about yeah. what it means to be, you know, anxious and fearful in a sense. That is very true. And I think that because therapists as well as non-therapists who haven't had those traumatic experiences are beginning to resonate what it must be like uh, because they themselves are affected by the tremendous changes that they have to make in their lives. Some of them are unemployed now. Some of them are having, you know, food store shortages and other things that they never dreamt of in their life. They felt rather secure. And I think it does give them a perspective of what it's like for those who have experienced trauma and don't have control over their environment because of what happened to them and felt helpless and hopeless. And so I think compassion is, is one of the strengths that we can provide and help people be able to tap into that sense of compassion and what, what we can do to help one another get through this. When I first, um, well, when everything kind of hit for me, you know, I was, was it, I think two weeks ago, things started mm -hmm. getting serious when both my kids were home. Mm -hmm. I have a four-year-old, she's no longer <laughs> in daycare, and then 11-year-old, he's no longer in school, and they're both home. And I, you know, and then the constant news, I'm someone who like, is kind of like a news junkie. Mm -hmm. And Fran, I, 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 was, I was getting so anxious with the yes. kids and then the news. And, and as I said quickly to myself, there's no way I can't do this. I've got to mm -hmm. dial it back yes. and change how I was. Otherwise it was going to mm -hmm. go nuts because I'm kind of normally kind of a little mm -hmm. higher on the anxiety scale, you know? Mm -hmm. So what mm -hmm. do you say to people who maybe are feeling that, that kind of omnipresent anxiousness from, cause it's not just, in our house, it's, it's global. It is global. And I think <clears throat> dialing it back is extremely important. We can become obsessed. And I found sometimes I was obsessed with it as well. And realizing that I was spending an enormous amount of time <laughs> trying to put together all the pieces of what happened and what I can do about it. And so what can we do so that we have balance in our life? Because more now than ever, we need a sense of balance and a sense of calm in the midst of a storm. And that, that reminds me of what the Buddha says. Um, what do you do in the midst of this storm? You sit and wait it out. You calm yourself. And so I think for families and for myself, finding outlets in a routine and maybe even maintaining a routine a bit will help to manage the anxiety that we all feel. For example, for those who like to walk and have a walking partner, continue to walk and modify the distance between you and the walking partner. I've done that with my walking partner of 15 years. I suggested that we have our cell phones with our earplugs and that we can continue to walk mm -hmm. uh, and be able to have that, that relationship maintained, that social interaction. And I think it's the same for families. If they can develop while they're under one roof, some opportunities for expression of of positive and negative feelings so that they can not hold it in or act it out inappropriately. For example, um, one of the things that I think is important is, in, is to engage the body. Mm -hmm. We're at home, we're limited by the walls of our home. 
some kids have outdoor yards, that's fine. They can go out and play in the yards, but some don't. But I think putting music on, and music is a wonderful vehicle that helps to um, get us moving in different ways. If we have an upbeat music, have the family dance together. Have them dance, get out some, some kitchen utensils and some pots and pans and drum together. Mm -hmm. have, have them play games, um, movement games, lay toys down on the ground and on the, on, the, on the floor of their house and have them hop around the toys or crawl over the toys or do some things that are fun, that bring laughter, that get the body moving, that get them moving in a way that releases anxiety and to begin to change their mood to a lighter mood and, and a playful mood. Um, so I think, I think those are really, really important. Um, just one of the funny things that my, my walking partner and I do is that when we would see one another on the street, and if she's about a half a block from me, uh, we would start to dance. <laughs> and we would walk and dance until we got together. <laughs> so now that the coronavirus is hit, so she said, let's do a coronavirus dance. So, you know, sure. we modified it and did this dance. And I think our neighbors probably, I don't know what they think, but they may think we're a bit weird. But, and we're not, gonna, not going to meet any dance contests, that's for sure. <laughs> but that's the kind of playfulness I think we all need to have in our environment to take what we have and use it as a golden opportunity and, um, and to maintain that social engagement that, uh, that um, Steve Poor just talks so much about. Um, one of the other thoughts I've been giving to parents that I work with is, uh, is to, to help their children maintain their connections with their peers is to set up a platform, a video communication platform like this, mm -hmm. and invite the yeah. friends and parents to participate and do art projects together, um, do dance routines together, do exercise, mm -hmm. do cooking lessons, um, chat about what they're experiencing and how they can get through it together bringing the parents and children together for these activities using uh, the web, I think, can help keep them from feeling so isolated. Because one of the things about trauma is that sense of isolation, right. and that nobody knows what we're going through, or um, we're living at 24-7, and we don't have any outlet. But if you can have an opportunity for children to get together under this platform, and even for parents to have a platform like this, to talk about creative ways to manage their kids at different ages and some of the fun things that they're doing and setting up a routine to do that um, at certain times of the day or that we're gonna do this during the day, or we're gonna work a puzzle or play a game or put the music on. I think that all can help mitigate some of the anxiety and depression and be a protect, productive way of, of mm -hmm. being able to get through this as time goes on because we, we are into this uh, and it could go on with social or physical isolation uh, for several weeks. We really don't know how long mm -hmm. it will go on. Yeah, I like the, the, you know, you're using this word creativity, not only being creative, but being creative about how we're using our time and how we're interacting and so forth. And one of the things that I found, you know, I was talking about my early experience when I started to get into this and got kind of frazzled, I realized mm -hmm. that I had to be flexible, right? Yes. Because normally with the kids and with everything else, I'm kind of like, okay, I like that structure and that routine, but a lot yeah. of that goes out the window. Yeah, it you know? does. And mm -hmm. it's being able to be flexible and, and creative at the same time, which right. isn't always easy. But, you right. know, as you're talking, Fran, there seems to be a, a gravity and a seriousness about 
the fact that we really need to be doing these things for our own good. Yes, we really do. And, um, and I think that if, if we can be flexible and be kind and compassionate toward one another and be kind and tolerant of our children <laughs> and <clears throat> be able to understand that we're all in this together and how can we make this a moment of growth and development for all of us? What can we do to teach our children how to handle stress and understand their stress and be empathic toward their stress and expressing ours as well so that we can meander through this and grow in the experience. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity if we can have that kind of mindset that this is a time when we have time with our children, time that we can value and how can we make it pleasant? And then there's a greater, greater perspective. What can we do to contribute to, to helping people in the, in the community that are less fortunate by giving money for food banks, by you know, making um, facial masks, uh, things like that, that can help. You know, getting, getting kids involved by showing what we're doing and talking mm -hmm. about that i think is a, a way of teaching them that they're part of a society and maybe in some way they could make thank you notes for the doctors nurses the frontline people ems workers thank you for working uh with these sick people you know and sending them pictures to uplift them so you know without being uh, without sugarcoating things or being trite, opportunities abound. They're all around us during this crazy time to kind of step up and, like you're saying, kind of model, mm -hmm. um, you know, healthy behavior and even present opportunities for a kid, like you're saying, to maybe send notes and so forth. Um, can you talk a little bit more specifically about how maybe you're working differently with your clients and? Also, uh, thoughts you have for the therapists out there who, you know, are maybe shifting gears now and working uh, right. on mm -hmm. Zoom and so forth. Yes, uh, I actually have been doing some Zoom and other platforms for many years because of my specialty and people's needs that uh, I I can provide for them. So I. I've developed a few strategies, particularly with children. <laughs> and I think that my playfulness and my um, sort of uh, side chair acting abilities kind of comes out <laughs> at those moments because when you are working with children, you have to really engage them through this kind of vehicle. And um, and I'm amazed at some of the silly things that I've done that I probably wouldn't do in my office as easily. <laughs> yeah. oh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you one of them that I've done. Okay. I'm yeah, going to be a little hum, humble about it. But um, I was with you this delightful seven-year-old boy for, for two years. And we would meet periodically in person, which was really a wonderful treat. But he lived many, many miles, many, many states away. And so uh, whenever he did something really good, you know, I said, oh, two thumbs up. And then I would say, two big toes up. <laughs> and in my own way, I would try to show my two big toes one at a time on the screen. Just, nice. just sort of make him laugh in playful, uh, kind of reinforcing, you know, well, that was really really good as you can catch it and I would praise him and so we would engage in that way and uh, his his um, his mother was present at the time and so I asked that, she, that he have uh, drawing supplies available and so he would draw his emotional states his different parts of himself and tell me about him his mother would show it to the screen she'd take a picture mm -hmm. of it and it, I would have it on my phone immediately so I would talk about that with him and he got a drum for Christmas and I said, 
why don't you use the drum and drum how you feel about what happened to you and and then he would drum so we would we would be able to use um you know principles of emdr the bilateral uh stimulation by the drumming and we would march and and uh i would make a <clears throat> And this is all via like Zoom or something? Oh, this is all Zoom. Huh? Yeah, all huh? Zoom. And I would stand up and I said, oh, we got to work out that tension of what happened to you out of your body. So I said, let's do the stomping dance. Let's st stand up and stomp and move around. And so, um, so I was well prepared in many ways, but I had a little boy that's uh, four years old that I uh, have been seeing. I was a bit anxious about having to meet him online because he was a rather subdued little boy, a little quieter. Mm -hmm. He wasn't maintaining much contact with me and he wasn't talking about uh, his feelings. And he, he said, I don't know, I don't know. And so I was just sort of, you know, wondering how am I gonna engage him? You know, how am I gonna get him to open up? You know, I have a hard enough time in the office when I'm sitting on the floor with him. <laughs> you know, and I've got to sort of make it really fun. And, and what, what I found to be most helpful was is that I would exaggerate and I was very emotional and I was very present and praising him. And, and so I, I, that's how I did it with him, with that kind of affect. And so I asked his parent who, uh, to make sure he, this little four-year-old has Legos on the floor because he loves Legos mm -hmm. and that's what he would do in my office and so he would show me the spaceship that he made and i couldn't believe it it was so intricate and i said wow. this is so amazing this is so creative and you did that and he said yes i did it in four hours i said four hours oh my gosh you did it in four hours it would have taken me forever <laughs> to do it and i was just really revving it up and just crazy he was looking at me through the camera and he move his eyes up <laughs> real closely to me. It was really amazing session. Wow. And, um, and then I said, I'm trying to get to the feeling states because he wasn't one to identify feelings. And I said, how do you feel that you felt this way? And he said, I don't know, <laughs> just what I've gotten before. I don't know. So, all right. So I had these little finger puppets here at my house. And so I got them different ones and I showed him the different finger puppets and I said well which one might look like the way you found and he picked out the happy one I said yeah what is that and he said happy I said yeah how does that look show me and, and I would model him and he'd go and I was <laughs> I was mirroring him I was totally mirroring you know what what he was doing and then we went through the different other feelings of sadness and anger and you know you know and he he had him right on his face he really wow. showed him it was amazing it was delightful and i could not believe it i mean there was something magic about what happened in the session and he i think enjoyed seeing himself and also seeing me this way and um you know at the end of the session he says surprisingly he came all the way up <laughs> I, won't, I won't do it but he came on and said i love you and i Aww. was just absolutely speechless at that point mm -hmm. so i think you know with young children we can be very playful and we can be terrible actors and they will love us anyway <laughs> you right. know we we can just really praise them and talk to them and get get a little bit more serious and you know but have that sort of playfulness and creativity with them uh with the one other boy that i brought into the discussion earlier the 79 year old um he uh uh we wanted to play a game and i had don't break the ice and he had don't break the ice so we both took our turns and played the game don't break the ice so there are creative ways of connecting mm -hmm. and therapeutically getting to the issues at hand. There, there may be some times when the child isn't up to it, just like we aren't up to it at times. So we have to sort of give them the space. But um, that's been very helpful. And with the older kids, um, you know, they draw pictures, they show them to me. We 
interact. Uh, I teach them techniques for calming down. They use them while they're in their own space. Um, Are you finding like, like uh, older kids, um, how are they, I mean, general, general, general question, but how are they responding to, to, to COVID-19? How are, is there something you need to do differently or obviously pay more attention to that or what? You know, I, I think in this community, to be very honest, we have, we only have like one so far in our county. I, I live in the northern part of Michigan, the Upper Peninsula, Michigan, and Marquette. And so the reality of that has not hit the children in this community. You know, they're, they're confined to their houses, they miss their friends, but there, mm -hmm. there, there is a little bit of anxiety that they have, but it's not like living in New York City where children are really suffering from people that they know or know of in their own town uh, dying. But if I had those children, it would be very important to talk about that and draw pictures of what you feel, uh, what's your feeling, what, what's your fear look like? Um, what is a hero figure in your life or a fictional figure that you can uh, draw that can help you and can comfort you when you're having these fearful times? Have a parent there to also talk to them and together talk to the parent and child about the challenges in, in what ways can they contribute, if any? I mentioned a little bit earlier, sending letters. Um, some people who so can, can do that, um, make different, you know, the, uh, surgical mask or whatever that is according to standard that would mm -hmm. be acceptable. Um, so one of the things that's really important in working with families is to work with the parents and helping them to calm down and so that they can be co-regulators of their children because children are very intuitive to the mm -hmm. way parents are. If they see parents really struggling, and sometimes they will be struggling if they've been financially hit by this and know a loved one who's ill, but to work with the parents and provide them the support and um, help them develop sort of a way to their own internal resources to deal with it so that they can um, be reassuring or be, be attuned to their child and the child's worry and anxiety, but not to depend on the child as a way of releasing their feelings, but to find a group online or talk to their friends that can be a support to them and find ways to calm down through meditation. I, I give parents and children uh, recommendations for apps that they can have to listen to meditation. I've made tapes for them on uh, safe place, uh, meditation of a calm um, lake or uh, a mountaintop, whatever they would like to visualize to help them calm down and uh, they listen to it on their phones. Mm -hmm. So this would be really important to do. Um, I think if, if people can come together with their friends and support one another and uh, be a co-regulator for one another and a good listener and um, uh, help them with all the adjustments that they have to make. I think that can calm down their stress response system. Um, I also think it's very important to work to help them express themselves through physical activity in the house. If they can do some yoga, there's yoga online, there's um, meditation uh, uh, websites that they can listen to. Uh, they can exercise. It's extremely important that the body stays calm. And I have a saying that I say to the children and, and to the adults, I can get it right. When the body is well, the mind is swell. 
So I work with them on noticing what's going on in the body and shaking it out, doing a little shaking dance, that I mm-hmm. call it the shaking dance, um, to find ways to release that stress and take some good deep breaths that help them to take the next step and to stress to them that all we have is this very moment right now and every moment is creating a new moment and what can we create in the next new moment Uh, there's a beginning and an ending of a moment and um, a lot of buddhism you know principles in that and um, let's take this new moment as an opportunity to develop some um, things that will help us find ways to connect on a positive way with with our children to help us feel that we have opportunities available for us or a certain mindset to help help us take that next step and what we can do in our home environment cooking you know having cooking lessons with our children having them bake uh, dancing with them with music uh, playing uh, a game as I've talked about puzzles doing things like this and fortunately we can order a lot of these things mm-hmm. and have them delivered so we're not putting ourselves at risk of going out and buying them uh, so uh, it's it's a combination of Uh, empathizing with the families and their stress level and helping them adapt and helping them find ways to have a sense of of control over their life in terms of what they do in the immediate moment and um, have some fun and creativity that can cut through some of that tension. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Wow. Uh, 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 a litany of really I think, <laughs> useful suggestions yeah. there. Um, the, the, the idea of co-regulation really stood out to me because it really, I really feel that, you know, all these things that, you know, you've been talking about um, really, again, to me are seeming, are feeling like so important. Like there's an opportunity now to really, you know, step up. I'm, talking about myself here but Mm -hmm. you know and start actually doing these things because it's not going to just help me it's going to help my child or or my family Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. keep um uh you know our immune system up and uh yeah so so important so important and uh, Stephen Porges talks about that uh that co-regulate co-regulation and the importance of of people in our lives and uh of being able to engage and and being attuned to one another, uh, being attuned and identifying what the other must be feeling and having that other talk about what those fears are and comforting one another and pulling together. When we work together, we stay together. Mm -hmm. When we work together, we stay together. And that we're working together and we're learning together to get through this. And sometimes children can have the wisest things to say about things that are so difficult. Mm. They can be so simple and yet so true. Uh, One thing that I would like to recommend, Ana Gomez, it's a wonderful child EMDR therapist, has just released for free a book for children about the coronavirus and it is called the book about oysters, oyster and butterfly. The book about oyster and butterfly, I believe. Ana Gomez. Ana Gomez, G O M E S. It's a lovely book. The book about the oyster and the butterfly. The book about the oyster and the butterfly. It's a beautiful book, and it's a it's a the oyster and the butterfly are symbols of, of out of adversity and struggle. The oyster develops this beautiful pearl, layers and layers inside, and then soon it becomes a pearl in the butterfly, in the cocoon as um, 
the uh, caterpillary struggles and shakes and then finally develops the wings. So it's out of the adversities that we face that we can develop a beautiful, you know, a beautiful things in our life that we can, um, we can get through this adversity mm -hmm. that, and be stronger as a result of it. And I think that's the message we want to give to parents and, and to all of us that what is really important is, is the relationships we have one another with one another. And again, it's not to dismiss the need for basics. We also need basics. Right. And, um, uh, but that relationship of holding one another together. I've worked with very poor families over my career. And what I found is they had one another and they were close. And it was that unity mm -hmm. in the face of their adversity that kept them together and kept them healthy. It was that healthy attachment. The, the parents that were attuned to the child were patient with the child, was kind. Even when the child was testing, they were patient and kind and compassionate and a gentle way of teaching them other ways to behave. And they, they had a loving relationship, even though they had very little. Wow. Uh, I've been speaking with Fran Waters. Fran, what's the best way for people to get in contact with you? Well, uh, I have a website, uh, and there is a form they can fill out. And the uh, name of the website is waterscounselingandtraining.com. Okay. waterscounselingandtraining.com. Uh, would probably be the best way to get a hold of me. I'm also on psychology today uh, okay. in my in my area of, of Marquette, Michigan as well. And I'll have that website listed up here at the show notes page at the traumatherapistpodcast.com. Fran, you are a, a delight and you're so <laughs> inspiring to talk to you. Seriously, please Thank come you. back to this podcast. I would love to come we, back. <laughs> we need you. We need you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Guy. All it right. was wonderful. Thank you so right. much for the opportunity. I Stay well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <All right>. you. <laughs> Take care. You too. Bye-bye.